I do hope that we appreciate and pray for and give thanks to God for our musicians and singers. We are abundantly blessed and appreciated so much last week hearing uh, Russ and Carolyn and Larry and Dwight sing. I have nobody like that today. I am not going to sing like Pastor Ted did last week. He was great. I would not be, and therefore, I will speak, but I promise not to sing. Would you please open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, and as we have our Bibles open, we are going to pray. And remember, particularly those of our fellowship who are recovering from surgery, Georgette and um, Sylvia Russell, and ask God for healing, for wisdom, and for encouragement. So please pray with me. Mighty God, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We pray that your kingdom come, that your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Thank you, Father, that only you know the end from the beginning. Only for you is everything possible. Only for you is nothing hidden. Father, we thank you for gathering us here today. We thank you for making us a family of your people, for uniting us by the presence of your Holy Spirit indwelling us. And Father, as a family, we have many needs to bring before you. We remember those who are ill, those who continue to mourn. Father, we pray for Georgette, Werner, for your comfort, for your peace, for your wisdom, for healing, for Georgette from surgery. We pray for Joe and Sylvia, also for your comfort and peace, and for Sylvia's recovery from knee surgery. Father, for others who are ill, bring healing. For those who are traveling, keep safe and free from illness or injury or accident. Watch over them. We pray for Pastor Keith and Ruth and for Carrie as they take time to be refreshed, to rest, to be renewed, to be able to return here filled with joy and energy to resume their ministries. Father, we thank you that today we are not alone in worshiping you. We are connected with others whom we have the privilege of support as they are spread across the world, engaged in ministries of translation and transporting missionaries and others and church planting and evangelism. We pray for the Smolders and for Darcy Chapman. We pray for the Newdorfs and for the Nelsons and the Macaulays that today you will grant them good health, encouragement, blessing, and fruit for their labor. Father, we pray for those that you have placed an authority over us. Father, at times we see what we think are only evil intentions. Yet we pray for a great work of your Holy Spirit in our country, that those in our cities, our province, our nation, will be touched by your Spirit and brought to confess sin and repent of sin and call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Father, turn them against abortion, against euthanasia, against every form of sexual immorality. Turn us to be a people of righteousness. Father, we know that all of these things must begin with each one of us as your spirit works in our lives. As we have your word open before us, we ask, Father, that you will teach us, that you will build us up, and we ask, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be pleasing 
and acceptable in your sight. We ask through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 15, we have the Apostle Paul starting to wrap up a fairly lengthy letter to a group of people who, as a church, seem to be able to make just about every mistake that comes along. And the main issue he's going to address in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians is the reality of the resurrection, the historical, factual, eyewitness realities and what this resurrection means for Christians. And it means everything. Our attention this morning is going to be most of all on the introduction to this review that he brings in verses 1 through 8. But before we get there, we need to read it and then take a look at another text of Scripture. So right now, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 8, follow along, please. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. This is the word of God. Hear it and let God bless our hearts through it. In the first century, in the city of Antioch, northeast of Jerusalem on the coast of the Mediterranean, city of about half a million people, it was the capital of the Roman province of Syria, and it was a church not established by Peter, John, Paul, or the other apostles, but it was established by people from Cyprus and Cyrene, some of whom had been scattered away from Jerusalem after the death of Stephen, as recorded in Acts 7 and at the opening of Acts 8. We read that the church was scattered all over the Mediterranean world. Now, the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem found out about this, they heard about it, and they sent a man named Barnabas as an emissary to investigate. Now Barnabas was the man who took Saul of Tarsus when he came to Jerusalem, and everyone was terrified of this man who had persecuted the church, who'd put Christians in prison. It was Barnabas who took Saul and brought him into the fellowship of the other apostles and elders. So they sent Barnabas to find out what was going on in Antioch. And when he got there, he was very excited, so he went looking for Saul, and he found him in Tarsus and brought him to Antioch. And the scripture says that the two men spent an entire year teaching these new believers. Now, if you go to Acts 11 at verse 22, we're going to discover something that affects all of us. In Acts 11, at verse 22, the report of this, what was happening in Antioch, came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. Now, here's the sentence. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. 
So that's how far back it goes. But it's interesting that this word Christian only appears two more times in Scripture. One of them is in Acts 28, where Paul is defending his faith, his ministry, his actions before Agrippa. And Agrippa says, you know, in such a short time, you're going to try to make me a Christian. And the other occasion is in 1 Peter 4.16, where Peter writes, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So it doesn't show up a lot in the New Testament, but it is the name by which we've been known for two millennia. But today, an ordinary Christian is, is hard to find. Someone who is a Christian, just a Christian. Now we're all hyphenated and modified and modifying other things. We have saved Christians, born-again Christians, evangelical Christians, mainline Christians, progressive evangelical Christians, reformed Christians, pietistic Christians, liberal Christians, charismatic Christians, plus the use of the word in many of the thousands of denominations around the globe, and at last count in the world, 87 political parties that use the name Christian in the name of their party, and one of them is right here in the True North Strong and Free. But 87 different political parties around the world. Uh, Christians also known as a modifier. Uh, Christian school, Christian bookstore, Christian bikers, Christian line dancing, Christian dating apps, and the oxymoronic Christian yoga. It reminds me of the dialogue in the famous Monty Python dead parrot sketch. Michael Palin plays the role of a shopkeeper who sold a parrot to John Cleese. But the parrot is dead. And John Cleese only discovers that when he gets the parrot home and finds out it's on its perch because it was nailed to the perch. And it is the number of words that both of them use to either deny that the parrot is dead or that it is dead. Palin says the parrot is resting, it is sleeping, it is just stunned, it is pining for the fjords. Cleese says it is dead, deceased, is no more, ceased to be, expired, gone to see its maker, bereft of life, it rests in peace, it's joined the choir and invisible. They use every word except dead. Now, I thought about my profile as a Christian, and I could, as you come in, I could introduce myself to any one of you and say, hi, my name is Reed, and I'm a saved, born-again, evangelical, orthodox, reformed, five-point Calvinist, nominal, 1689, Canadian Baptist Christian. Amen. And if you think that's funny, go on Twitter and read some of the profiles that Christians have. It's just about that bad. Which brings us back to our text here in 1 Corinthians 15. And I'd like to think of us, in a sense, the way that the nation of Israel organized themselves. The nation was Israel. And then there were tribes, the 12 tribes. And then there were clans, and within the clans there were families. Our nation is Christianity. Our tribe is Baptist. Our clan is Canadian Baptist of Western Canada. Our family is Maranatha Baptist Church. And I'll have more to say about that in a few minutes. But what is Paul telling the Christians in Corinth? And by God's grace and inspiration, also telling us. Well, first of all, he's telling us that we need to be reminded of what we believe. That's how he begins this text. Now, I would remind you, and we are people that need constant reminding of who we are and what we are under God. There is an edge in the way Paul opens this reminder, indicating that some of the folks in Corinth really, really, really need to be reminded. Corinth had all kinds of issues. As you read through the letter, they had these skewed 
loyalties. I am a Paul, of Apollos, I am a Peter, I am a Paul, or the truly spiritual said, I am of Christ. They were tolerating sexual sins. They had disruptive worship services. They had very troublesome misunderstandings of marriage. There was abuse of the Lord's Supper. There was malpractice with spiritual gifts. And obviously, some of them had serious problems with the resurrection. And that's why this reminder is given by Paul about who they are and who we are. And he now lists four verbs, four events that are essential to the gospel. And you notice in our text that Paul teaches only what I also received, meaning that what he is writing, what he is giving to the people is directly from the risen Lord Jesus. It's the same language he uses about the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. What I also received, I pass on to you, I give to you. There's nothing omitted that comes from the Lord Jesus. There is nothing added, there's nothing left out. And his first fact is that Christ died for our sins. For our sins. As Paul wrote in another letter in Romans chapter 3, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There are no exceptions. All of us have sinned. This is actually the first of what are called the doctrines of grace, the doctrine of total depravity. That does not mean that we all behave as badly as we can on every occasion. It's our spiritual DNA which renders us spiritually dead and having absolutely no ability to save ourselves. John 5, 24, Jesus says, Truly, truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. We need to be reminded that Christ died for our sins. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Christ has died for our sins. There was a reason. There was a purpose. The second thing Paul points out is that he was buried. That's why the gospel writers all mention right about the tomb, ensuring that we know Jesus was not just hidden somewhere for a couple of days. It was a tomb with a stone rolled in front of it. In fact, the women who went early on the first day of the week to go to the tomb to care for the body of Jesus were concerned that they would not have the strength to roll that stone back to get into the tomb. Paul wants us to understand that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and the third is that he was raised on the third day. He's saying the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus all happened for our salvation. And all the Gospels record that details of the discovery that Jesus is no longer in the tomb reveal that he is risen, that he is risen indeed. But we need to be reminded. This is about atonement. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and raised again on the third day. But there is a fourth Thing that Paul is talking about here. That is, we need to be persuaded about why we believe. Because what he comes up with next in verses 5 through 7, look at them again, because these are very, very important. Verses 5 through 7, Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, 
as to one untimely born. He appeared also to me. But it, it's these appearances after he was risen that are so critical. He appeared to eyewitnesses. These listed are sort of a partial list an initial list of the subsequent eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And we know that most, if not all of them, had to be persuaded that he actually had risen. They need to be reminded of what has happened. Now they need to be persuaded of why we believe. And there is a wonderful question that Paul puts to King Agrippa that I mentioned earlier when the word Christian is used for the second time in Acts. In Acts 26, 8, Paul asks, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Why, why do you think that's incredible? Yet they have to be persuaded. They have to be persuaded that we serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. We know this because of the testimony of these many eyewitnesses and the testimony of the Holy Spirit who brings us to salvation, who enables our faith to believe and indwells us at the moment we call on the name of the Lord to be saved and guides us as he sanctifies us through our entire Christian lives. However, there is much recorded about the level of doubt among the followers of Jesus after the resurrection. At first, the women were not sure. They, they didn't know what had happened, but they knew that his body was not in the tomb. Mary thought that they had taken his body and relocated it somewhere. Please, she asks, thinking she's asking the gardener, who is actually the risen Lord, she says, please tell me where they've taken it. The disciples did not believe the women. The two people that Jesus joined walking on the road to Emmaus that day, they didn't believe it either. They said, well, they said he's risen, but, 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 they doubted. And then, of course, Thomas. Doubting Thomas. I will not believe unless I see and can put my hand where the wounds were, the nail marks. And Matthew records in 28, verses 16 and 17, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. They needed to be persuaded. And there are many many things about which we as believers often need to be persuaded. Paul records that the disciples were granted the privilege and joy of actually seeing in person the risen Lord Jesus. These are the ones whom Peter refers to in defending the actions of the apostles when he appears before the Jewish ruling council, the Sanhedrin. In Acts 4, 19 and 20, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And in chapter 5, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins and we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. These were the Christians who were going to be harassed, scattered, imprisoned, mocked, persecuted, and martyred for the sake and name and course of Jesus. And they, like us, had to persevere through it all because of what Jesus had done in their lives. Old American scholar Charles Hodge wrote, all these considerations concur in proof of the resurrection of Christ and render it the best authenticated event in the history of the world. 
Yet, those closest to him needed to be persuaded. How about you? Is there anything about what you as a Christian need to be persuaded? How about if you're not a Christian? Do you need to be persuaded about salvation? There are things that do not make you or anyone else a Christian. You do not become a Christian by inheritance. As someone has rightly said, God has no grandchildren. You don't inherit Christianity. You do not become a Christian by good works. We can do nothing to earn, to merit, to deserve the grace of God to, to, to make us worthy. We do not want to be like Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York City, in a USA Today newspaper interview in 2014. This is something that Bloomberg said to Kristen Powers, his interviewer. He said, I am telling you, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I am heading straight in. I have earned my place. He is going to be surprised. You do not become a Christian by works. You do not become a Christian by baptism. That is a fallacy believed by millions and millions of people around the world. I've been told by people that they are Christians, and they say, I was born an Anglican or Lutheran or Presbyterian or fill in the blank. No, you weren't. You were born a sinner, like everybody else on the face of the earth, and your parents went through a ritual, by the way, without your consent, and your name was entered into the books of whatever denomination that was. and may still be on their books today, but that does not make you a Christian. You do not become a Christian by association. No matter where you live, or if you attend church, or hang out with real Christians, none of this counts for salvation. And you do not become a Christian by self-assertion. You are not a Christian just because you say you are a Christian. That may be a deadly self-deception. Those are things that you need to be persuaded about. You need to be persuaded about salvation that it comes only by faith alone, through grace alone. And it only comes through Jesus Christ, not in any of these other ways. Now, if you are a Christian, you're here, you're watching, some of you need to be persuaded about ministry. Until God takes us to heaven, we are not done with ministry. I've heard excuses. I am too old. I am too young. I have no experience. That is not my gift. I have no time for that. I'm afraid. I mean, there's absolutely nothing more terrifying than a junior high Sunday school class. That's understandable. But you need to be persuaded about ministry. You need to understand that when you become a Christian, you have entered into a job for a lifetime. When a church runs out of its need for volunteers, that church is dead. We always need more volunteers. You need to be persuaded about ministry. Some of you need to be persuaded about membership. The churches of the Fraser Valley are not a gigantic buffet from which you go and pick and choose. Let's see, I, I like the music at this one. I like the preaching at this one. I like the kids' programs at this one. I like the parking at this one. Choosing a church home is not about your happiness or your felt needs. It's about being where God wants you to be. And again, I have, I have heard all of the reasons and excuses. I'm still looking for a church home. I'm a member of the body of Christ, and that's enough. 
I was a member of a church, and I was hurt. So are you reluctant because you think that we are going to hurt you as well? Or how about this? When it's said about a relationship that seems stalled, you ever been in one of those relationships that you wish would grow and grow and grow, and the other person says to you, it's not about you, it's about me. What does that mean? That's really not true. It's obviously about you. If you have no problem with the church's doctrine, its preaching, its worship, its teaching, its fellowship, how do you know that it's not the church where you should be entering into covenant with all the members? We need to get over ourselves sometimes. Marvelous new book just published this year, Carl Truman writes in Strange New World how in the past 50 years, even 100 years, we've gone from functioning by objective truth and fact to functioning more by feelings and by emotions. Our autonomous self wants to ignore God and, and make all our own decisions. And Truman writes this. He says, we cannot help but choose the church in which we worship. Even the cradle Roman Catholic today chooses to continue to attend church because there are many other available options, including not attending church at all. But having chosen the church, we can discipline ourselves to be committed to that church, to stick with it, to refuse to allow ourselves to move on simply because of some trivial matter of personal taste should be obvious to us. But sometimes the obvious somehow eludes us. About five years ago in our city, I went to a service station, filled up with gas, and I wanted to take my car through a car wash. Yes, I'm lazy. I prefer to do it that way. And there was a sign in front of the entrance to the car wash, and it's a car wash not open. So. I went around and I was going to fill up with gas anyway, and I noticed another gentleman who'd taken his vehicle over to the vacuums and was doing stuff with it. So I filled up with gas, and just out of curiosity, I went around again, and the sign was gone. And so I went in and I punched in my code, went in and washed, and it was getting waxed, and I'm coming out, and those massive dryers are blowing. And I looked up, and the man who had parked and was vacuuming was now standing right beside my window. And he wanted to ask me something, so I put my window down, and above the blowing dryers and everything, he said to me, is it working yet? <laughs> I wanted to say no, <laughs> but I didn't. I just closed my window and, and drove on. Sometimes what is obvious eludes us. When I became a member here, I knew membership has its privileges, but for me it was not the privilege of having a voice in the decision-making of the congregation. It was not the privilege of being eligible to hold some offices of the church. It was the privilege of being accepted as a brother in Christ by the good saints, the brothers and sisters of this family. That's what mattered most. And there are some of you that need to be persuaded to join with us in covenant, to continue God's work in this place. We need to be persuaded about why we believe. Third, in verse 8, we need to be certain about what we believe. This is Paul. Then he appeared last of all as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me as one untimely born. When he says last of all, he still means that he is equal in authority to that of the other apostles, but that this is the end of all such appearances. He is the last of the apostles. 
And the language he uses here, untimely born, is a language that is used in ancient writing for an abortion. That is how Paul describes his coming to faith. He felt it was something he did not deserve. But he needed to be persuaded, and he knows that we need to be certain. Fritz Reinecker says, that which is incapable of sustaining life of its own volition and requires divine intervention if it is to continue, that is what it means to be a Christian, just a Christian. When Paul was first converted, he didn't fit. As far as the other disciples and apostles were concerned, Saul of Tarsus was the enemy. So he had to be absolutely certain of what had happened to him and what he believed, as do we. Are you certain of what you believe? There's a marvelous passage in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland where Alice on her journey meets up with the Cheshire Cat. Alice, can you please tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? The cat says that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. Alice says, I don't much care where. The cat says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. We need to be certain. Just a Christian. All of us have seven shared and necessary experiences to be called Christians. And in these seven words, we need to know that all of them, every one of them, is an essential word. And if you listen to these and you think of any of them and you think, hmm, maybe that's missing from, from my experience. Maybe that didn't happen to me. The first word is chosen. This is called in Scripture election, predestination, and it's the truth of which some still need to be persuaded. If you look back in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verses 6 through 9, we find Moses explaining to the people of God why they are the people of God. In Deuteronomy 7, beginning of verse 6, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Do you understand that? Do you hear that? Do you appreciate that? That God chose them not because they were bigger or better, not because they were in some way special compared to others. He chose them solely out of his grace because he loved them. John 6, 37, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And in John 15, verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Then Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 3 through verse 6. These incredible words about God's grace and God's love. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, 
even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. You are chosen. You are a Christian. You're not an accident. This didn't happen by chance. This didn't happen because your parents had you baptized as an infant. It's because God chose you. And we read the same thing in Revelation 13, verses 7 and 8, about the beast that it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. God has chosen us. Second word, conviction. Before we come to being forgiven and redeemed, we are at first convicted of our sin and our need for our Savior. Why would I need to be saved if I didn't think I was at risk? And to understand this, we need to go to the words of Jesus in John chapter 3, beginning of verse 16, but not stopping with verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But Whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Conviction of our sin, that we are not worthy to be saved. And then the third word, confession. The word confession means to agree with that we agree with God that we are sinners. We agree with God that Jesus is the only Savior. We agree with God that we can only receive forgiveness and eternal life by coming to him by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in Acts 4, 12, Peter says, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And Paul wrote his letter to the Christians in Rome, chapter 10. He outlines for us what happens in this process of becoming a Christian, just a Christian. Romans 10, verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Fourth word, conversion. This is what happens. Paul describes it in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him, that is, in Jesus. You also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, 
We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We've got these things that happen in an order but almost seem to happen simultaneously that we confess our sin and we call on the name of the Lord and we are saved and the Holy Spirit at that moment indwells us, baptizes us. He enters into our lives and we are converted. Just a Christian. And then comes change. Incredible change. Ephesians 2 again in verses 4 through 9. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not a result of work so that no one may boast. In his first letter, John wrote chapter 3, verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. We were spiritually dead, and we became spiritually alive. We were changed. The life that counts and continues for eternity. And then out of that, out of conversion and change comes commitment. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. James wrote, chapter 2, verse 18, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Becoming a Christian comes with a to-do list. It comes with a job of a lifetime for a lifetime. The American Bible Society completed a survey, people of all ages, all generations, a couple of months ago, the results just came out this past week. And there's this incredible number of people in some of the generations, like Generation Z and, and um, the millennials, and oddly enough, people over 77 years of age, where between 37 and 40% of them say they are committed to Jesus, but they are not going to church. Intentionally, they are not going to church. I tell you, if you're not going to church, you are not committed to Jesus, no matter what you may answer to a surveyor's questions. You are not committed to Jesus. The seventh word, completion. Philippians 1.6. Paul writes, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Can we be sure of that happening? Absolutely. Go to John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30. Jesus is speaking about his sheep. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And then in Romans chapter 8, at the end of the chapter, in verses 38 and 39, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a gospel which you receive, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Paul writes here, if you hold fast 
the word I preach to you. Many years ago in the city of Whitehorse, we had a couple come into the church, and I've told this story many times with this man's permission because he was very pleased about it. And uh, by the way, the reason I'm going to tell you this story is because when Pastor Keith comes back, he should come in on the first day and find a lineup outside of his door of those who want to become members, to be baptized, to become members. Should be a lineup. We had been on vacation and study leave for six weeks. And we got home very early in the evening. And it had been a long drive when you come up the Alaska Highway with two children and two adults and your dog in a Volkswagen Rabbit. Before the highway was paved, that's a long journey. Within a half an hour, the phone rang. The man on the other end was a man named Vim. He and his wife had relatives in our church, and they had moved from the Netherlands to Whitehorse. He had been a jet fighter pilot in the Royal Dutch Air Force, used to fly reconnaissance missions all over Europe as part of NATO. This was still during the Cold War. They moved to Whitehorse, and he was now the city dog catcher. Bit of a come down from a jet fighter pilot to a dog catcher, but he didn't mind. But he phoned me. He said, I, I, I drove past your house, see your home. I have to tell you that while you're away, I became a Christian. I knew that he'd been raised in a, in a nominal family, a Baptist family in Holland. And of course, I was very excited. And he said, do you remember the last Sunday before you went away, the last song that we sang? And I'm, you know, I, I want to have him think that I would remember before I could answer, he said, it was the family of God. This Bill and Gloria Gaither song, and this is the 70s, so it wasn't old at, at that point. And he said, I stood at the back, and I listened, and I watched people from behind, and I realized I was not part of the family. And he went home. He started reading through the book of Isaiah and through the scripture. He gave his life to Christ because he knew he wasn't in the family. Five weeks later, I got a 911 call from his wife. He said, please come over right now. I went over, and like we often did in Whitehorse, I just walked in the kitchen, and the poor woman was seated, seated at the kitchen table, and he was standing over her with a Bible, browbeating her, saying, why can't you see this? Why can't you get this? I did had to calm him down. They eventually both came to Christ, moved to Moose Jaw, and he started training Canadian fighter pilots. But it all happened because he wanted to be a Christian, just a Christian, and he realized he was not part of the family. I give you these closing thoughts. A Christian is a person who has confessed their sin, repented of their sin and called on the name of the Lord to be saved. A Christian is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. Number three, a Christian is forgiven, atoned for, redeemed, justified, sanctified, and their salvation is secured for eternity. Number four, a Christian is expected to carry out a lifetime of good works prepared for them by God. Number five, if you are not a Christian, you are currently under condemnation by God and at risk of eternal damnation. Number six, if you are a Christian, this is what you are before you are anything else. You are just a Christian. Number seven, if you are not a Christian, will you today call on the name of the Lord and be saved. We, we need to hear again 
these last words from Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Pray with me. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we know that you love us. For most of us in this room and perhaps watching, you have redeemed us. You have brought us into your kingdom by your grace through faith in the Lord Jesus. And Father, our prayer today is that we might be so thrilled again as we're reminded of this truth that we will at every opportunity share it. And Father, for anyone listening who has not yet come into your kingdom, may this be the day in which they are born again. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.